Hello! Welcome to the Arizona State Museum, everybody! It is so nice to see you! My name is Miss May, and today we are going to explore the Autumn culture featured in the Passive Life exhibit. The Autumn ancestral lands and their reservations are located here in southern Arizona. Inside, we will learn about their way of life, as well as take a look at some cultural objects. There will be a few questions to answer, so make sure you have your thinking caps on, notepads, pencils, and pay close attention. We are going to learn a lot today. Let's head to the Passive Life Autumn section now. Here we are in the Autumn section of the exhibit. We will explore some of their history and traditions as well as learn about their unique relationship to the desert. Now we are currently standing on Autumn traditional lands. The Autumn have been here since time immemorial in the southwest area. Their traditional lands are mostly located in southern Arizona, but also extends down into northern Mexico. The Mexico and U.S. border did not exist back then. But the Autumn had traditional places, communities, people, and materials in both countries. Some of these materials are here in the exhibit. Let's take a moment to figure out some Autumn words that are displayed at the top of this panel. Autumn means people, or the name they call themselves. The word Tohono means desert. The word Akemer means river. Now here is a challenge for you. Put all of these words together and figure out what these words mean. I'll give you a few seconds. Did you get it right? Good job! The Aatam recognize all the people as Aatam, but there is a reason as to why we distinguish between river and desert people. We will find this out later as we go through the rest of the exhibit, but for right now, let's take a closer look at this map. Alright, I know it's a little hard to see the colors here, but there are two different ones, peach and pink. The peach color marks the boundaries of the Aatam traditional lands, or the lands that they have occupied for thousands of years. The Atum have traditional stories that tell about the creation of these lands and how their ancestors came into being in this area. The pink colored are the reservations now. As you can see, their boundaries became smaller, and this indicates that something happened in history to the Atum starting with the arrival of the Spanish around the 1600s. We will talk a little bit about what happened in American history in the 1800s when we get to that panel. Now, Locate the Tohono and Akimer traditional lands. The Tohono region is right in the middle and continues south towards Mexico. The Akimer are just to the right and the region heads north towards central Arizona near Phoenix. You can see that in the Akimer region there are a lot more rivers, which means they had a lot more water sources. And what can we use rivers for? Well, it can be used as a water source. Fishing, farming, washing, bathing, all kinds of things. But down where we are, the Tohono had less river sources. Where would you find water? Maybe from plants, like cactuses, or springs, or maybe water from the mountains when the snow melts. Have you been to Sabino Canyon? Is there water there? Most likely they use this water source too. Now there's a third group over here to the left called the Hiachet. Hiachet means sand dune people, but in this exhibit we only talk about the desert and river people, so we will only focus on them. Let's take a look at the pink colored areas. According to this map, there are a few reservation areas. Starting from the top, the Salt River Reservation, the Gila River, the Akjin, the Zahona Reservation, and the San Javier. Here are some questions for you. Which reservation is closest to Tucson? Which reservations are closest to Phoenix? Use the stars on the map to help figure this out.
Did you get them right? Excellent! Let's move on to the next panel that talks about the Nawa ceremony. But before we do that, we need to listen to an Aatham story about the wind and rain and how this annual ceremony started. The Aatham have many songs and stories about water because it is so important. In one Tohona song, Elder Brother or Iitoi told the people that the world would burn without rain. Can you imagine how hot that would have to be in order for it to burn? Well, at one point in time, a long time ago, the people did feel like the world was going to burn when the wind and rain left. When the rains leave, what happens to the land? What happens to the plants? The animals? The people? It does get hot here in the desert in the summertime, but what also happens in the summertime to make sure the lands don't dry up? Monsoons. So let's listen to the wind and rain story told by Aatham storyteller Lois Liston to learn more about monsoon seasons and why the Aatham perform a special ceremony for the wind and rain. Word of caution, the Aatham only tell stories in the winter time. So if it is not winter and you wish to skip this story, please do and find the next section on the Nawat ceremony display. Skugtash. Long ago, the people, the animals, and wind and rain lived together. Wind was very active. It would throw up dust, move around, but people were, were not happy with that because they would have dirt on them and get on their children, their people, their, all the things that they had. They were upset with wind. They said, you know, for him to stop blowing the dust around. Pretty soon, Wind began to feel bad because the people didn't want him. So he would tell his friend, Rain, that the people didn't want him. So Rain would tell him, it's okay, we'll, we'll be all right. People kept telling Wind, you know, stop moving around, stop stirring up the dirt. You're getting it on all of us, on our people, on our things. So Wind, he started to feel bad. So he told his friend, Rain, let's leave because the people don't want me here. And, you know, you're my friend. and will go and go somewhere else. So they did. They left the, the village. But pretty soon the people started to notice that the land was getting dry. Uh, nothing would grow. So they asked for Elder Brother to come and help them because they didn't know what was going on. Elder Brother, which is called Ito in autumn, told them, well, you send away wind who brings the rain, who has rain with them. And because of that, you're not getting any moisture. So Itoi told the people, you need to send some messengers. So they sent coyote, crow, uh, roadrunner, and um, hummingbird. So the messengers left as they started their journey to go seek for wind and rain. Uh, coyote said, well, you know, I'm getting hungry. I can't go anymore. So he went back to the village. Crow, he started to um, feel like he couldn't do it anymore and he needed to see his family so he turned around and went back to the village. A road runner was still trying to go and then he'd fly and then he'd go but he finally he, he was having a hard time so he went back to the village. But Hummingbird, Hummingbird kept going and finally uh, found where wind and rain were and so they um, so he told them the people miss you they want you back. And so Wind said, well, if they will do ceremony for us, we'll come back. So Hummingbird went back to the village and told the people. And the people said, okay, we're gonna, we'll do ceremony for four nights. And on the fourth night, they felt the wind start blowing. Then after the wind came, then the rain was right behind it. They celebrated because they, the wind and the rain returned back and they were able to water the ground and they were able to grow their crops. Wow! 
What an awesome story. Thanks, Miss Lois Liston, for sharing your cultural story with us. The autumn depend on the summer rains for their crops as well as for the edible plants that can be found in the desert, like the saguaro fruit. In late June, early July, the saguaro fruit ripens, and this marks the new year for the autumn. At this time, the autumn gather the fruit and prepare it for processing. They gather the fruits for both consumption as well as for the preparing of the Nawat ceremony. Here is a photo of a saguaro. The fruit grows way up at the top. Now how do you suppose you get the fruit down? Climbing the saguaro is not such a good idea. Well, how about pulling or knocking it down? The autumn do just that by using a cactus picker made out of saguaro ribs. Have you ever seen a saguaro rib before? If you've seen a decaying saguaro, you might have noticed them sticking out from it, like this. The autumn take these ribs and tie them together to form a longer stick. Then, they put a short piece at the end of it. This part grabs onto the fruit and makes it easier to pull or knock the fruit down. Take a look at my autumn friend here, using a traditional cactus picker to pull it down. Pretty neat, huh? Families come together to help gather the fruit. One person tugs the fruit down, and as the fruit falls, someone at the bottom makes sure it makes it into a bucket or a basket. Once collected, the fruit is peeled, and the fruit is stored for later use. The peels and the seeds are left behind for saguaros to regrow, or for the birds. They need food too. Just some words of caution. We all can't just go around collecting saguaro fruit anywhere. If it's in your own backyard, maybe it's okay, but in certain places outside of your property, collection is against the law, since the saguaro is protected by the state. They need the protection because the saguaro takes a long time to grow and can live up to 150 to 200 years. If something were to happen to them, it takes a long time to regrow another one. So it's a good idea to check your laws to make sure collection is okay. You might have to obtain special permission the federal government protects the Aatham rights to continue their traditions in gathering in cultural places, such as the Saguaro National Park. This means the state must recognize these rights as well. Just like their ancestors before them, the Aatham continue their traditions in protecting and gathering the Saguaro fruit throughout the Sonoran Desert. Let's talk about the process in making Saguaro syrup and ceremonial wine. Traditionally, the fruit is boiled down to a syrup in a clay cooking jar like this one. You can see the old fire markings all around the sides and towards the bottom of this pot. Sometimes the autumn use modern pots as well, like this one. The pulp and seeds are separated by using a plated basket or a modern strainer. The pulp is then put aside and dried for later. The syrup can be used to make candies, jellies, or jams. The syrup can also be set aside and left to ferment in large pots to make the wine. During the ceremony, the wine is transferred into a ceremonial basket. This basket is woven so tightly that it holds the wine pretty well without leaking. They stir and serve the wine using a ladle like this one made from mesquite wood. These tools in the display are about a hundred years old. Today, the Atham make and use traditional tools like these, and they also use modern tools. Did you know there are other uses of the saguaro? Check out these other traditional tools. This is a calendar stick. Can you guess what part of the saguaro this calendar stick is made from? Just like the cactus picker, it is also made from the saguaro ribs. Calendar sticks are tools used to keep personal memories of events that happen during the years. The horizontal line markings indicate years. So the first line is the first year, second line is the second year, and so on. The symbols represent significant events that happen in each of those years. And only the one who made the calendar stick knows what those symbols mean. This one-foot calendar stick is a small representation of what a larger one would look like. Calendar sticks are much, much longer and can record years and years of important memories. 
Here is another tool. This is called a burden basket. Can you see the sawawa ribs in this basket? Here is an old photo of some Atham ladies carrying a lot of pottery with this burden basket. Here is another interesting tool. This is called a cactus boot. <laughs> no, you don't wear the boots, silly. Have you ever noticed how some sawawas have holes or cuts along their sides? Well, birds love to make nesting homes in the cactuses to help protect them and their eggs. When they move out, the cactus heals itself, kind of like a scab. When you cut yourself, your body heals and forms a scab to protect you. The same works for the cactus. Over time, this scab forms and eventually falls off. This piece happened to fall off and look just like this. What are some ways that you can use this? I'll give you some time to think about it. Any good ideas? Some students have said they would use it to play catch or they would use it to store things. Others said they would use it for a scoop to pick up foods or water. All are great ideas. Who remembers what Tohono means? It's right up there. Right, desert. This panel is about the desert people. Traditionally, they had two different villages and they moved to where water was available. One village for the winter and one for the summer. In the winter, they built houses made out of adobe and they built them near mountainsides or foothills. In the summer, they built homes in the desert made from mesquite wood and acateo branches. Here's an old photo of a summer home. They built farms near arroyos or washes where the rain or snow melt runs down to a large floodplain. They used the floodplain waters for their crops. This is called akchin farming. Akchin meaning the mouth of the wash. Akchin. Does that word sound familiar? If you remember on the reservation map, one of the reservations is called the Akchin Reservation. Today they still build and use these traditional homes using the same traditional materials and they still grow traditional crops. What does Akermara mean? You got it, river people. And what major Arizona central city do they live near? Do you remember? Here's the map again to help you. Phoenix. The major rivers they live near are the Salt River, the Gila River, and the Santa Cruz. These rivers used to flow mostly year-round and definitely during the monsoon rains, so the Akimata didn't have to move around so much to find water. So they built their villages near the major rivers. They did a lot more farming back then and now. Just like the Tohono, they still are awesome, skillful farmers. For example, take a look at this Aatham farmer here. What do you think he is doing? He's not fishing, but he's building something. It has to do with farming. He is building an irrigation canal. He is building one just small enough to water his crops. He starts at one of the major rivers and makes a little pathway for the water to flow towards his crops. He is being very careful not to make the canal too big and take up too much water from the river because what will happen if you do? The river may shrink or disappear, or there won't be enough for the other farmers. So it is important that we think smart about these things. So what kind of food did the Akimer and the Tohono gather in the desert? And what did they grow on their farms? Most of these foods you probably have tried before. Do you recognize some of these seeds? Corn, peas, and squash. Wheat is also another crop they grew. We will talk about wheat crops later, but for right now, let's talk a little bit about corn. Corn is a food that has been around for thousands of years, and cultural groups have exchanged these seeds over time. As a matter of fact, cultural groups introduced corn to the early Europeans and taught them how to grow this food. An average corn seed can take up to 75 to 90 days, but the them are such good corn farmers that they developed a corn seed that takes 60 days to grow. This is due to the corn's ability to adapt to the desert heat, the use of the summer rains, and the traditional farming ways of the Atham over the years. 
These are uh uh them corn seeds. Another desert food that grows pretty well in the intense summer heat is a tepary bean. They uh uh them gather these in the desert or plant them in their fields. This bean plant can survive the most extreme temperatures in the summer and can survive with little water. An interesting fact, the more stressed the plant is in heat and drought, the more it produces. This bean is a good protein and fiber source to help control cholesterol levels. Here is a dish made with tepary beans. You should try it sometime. It's really good. Do you know what this desert cactus is called? It's the choya, and it looks pretty thorny. You don't want to get caught up in this plant, but did you know you can eat it? The autumn gather the buds and cook them in their foods. This autumn girl is using tongs to pluck the buds. The choya buds taste just like asparagus and contains a lot of calcium. Two tablespoons of choya contains just as much calcium as a glass of milk, and they can also help balance blood sugar levels. Look at this yummy salad dish. You have your greens, the choya buds, and what are those little brown reddish things? Ah, tepary beans. This is one way to eat healthy and mix up traditional foods. Do you recognize this tree? How about these seeds? These are mesquite beans. You might have a mesquite tree growing in your yard or around your neighborhood. Mesquite has a sweet taste, and the autumn sometimes gather these pods and soak them in water to make a sweet drink. But they also grind them into flour. And what can we use flour for? Well, just like wheat flour, we can make cakes, breads, and maybe even cookies. Substituting white flour with mesquite flour is a good healthy choice, and this also helps to keep the blood sugar low. You may have seen these seeds before in the grocery store. These are chia seeds, and these little guys are super healthy too. When soaked in water, they form a gel-like substance around the seed, pretty much like jello. Chia is sometimes used as a thickening agent in food recipes, like salads, soups, smoothies, or pudding. Here is some chia pudding I ate the other day. It tastes really good. You add a little bit of chia seeds in a bowl, fill it with almond milk or any other type of milk, add a sweetener to it, stir it up, and set it in the refrigerator and wait for it to thicken. Tastes just like pudding. You can add chocolate or any kinds of fruits to it too. Here are some other foods a friend of mine had the other day with chia added to it. Do you see the chia? Let's move on to the next display to see the baskets that may have been used to collect all these foods. What designs do you see in these baskets? Well, I see people in this one. What about this basket? It looks like a flower or a plant. How about this one? another flower or a plant. What do you think these baskets are made of? What kind of plants? Here are some more photos of some baskets so you can get a closer look at the materials. You can see that maybe they use some type of grass or needle-like fibrous plants. Look at the different colors. The autumn use bare grass yucca, and devil's claw. They also use different types of roots and willow. Bear grass is gathered in bunches and you can see this lady here carrying a large bundle of bear grass. This is what bear grass looks like up close. It is usually green when it's freshly picked but over time it turns yellow. This is yucca. It almost looks like bear grass but it feels a little bit more like grass, a little bit more flimsy. And what about this plant? Do you know what this is? It's devil's claw. 
The devil's claw plant grows green and the flowers are purple. In the middle of it is the fruit pod and the fruit is edible. The stems growing out from the pod are what is used in basket making. Basket makers soak the stems and strip them into strands. Can you see the devil's claw in this basket? It's the darker pieces making the design. What about the lighter color? What plant is that? Right, yucca. Here's a closer look. Pretty neat, don't you think? Have you ever made a basket before? When water became scarce, the plant materials became scarce. The Aotham had to use other materials that were introduced to them by the Europeans and Americans. Do you see a basket here that is different from the others? What do you think it's made of? These baskets were made from wire. This material helped the Aotham continue their basket making techniques when grasses weren't available. When Americans were trying to make it to California during the gold rush, they had to pass through Aotham lands along the Gila Trail. As they were passing, they saw the large Aotham wheat fields and were impressed by the great success that the Aotham had in farming. The Aotham grew over 3 million pounds of wheat, and you can imagine how massive those fields may have looked to the Americans back then. Americans saw farming as an opportunity to make a profit by selling their crops. The Aotham also traded and sold their foods, but mostly wanted to feed their community rather than make a profit. So the Americans decided to move in and try to be just as successful. You remember the Aatham farmer who was building the canal from the river? And do you remember why he built a little canal? Well, the early Americans didn't really think smart. They thought more competitively and wanted to become the best farmers, so they built huge canals. This is one example of a canal that the Americans built, called the Florence Canal. This tapped into one of the major rivers of the Akamer Aatham, the Gila River, and it diverted waters to American crops. This took away a lot of water from the Akamer and the Tahana Aatham. Major river sources affected were the Santa Cruz, San Pedro, and Salt Rivers. The Santa Cruz River eventually dried up and water barely came and went when the rains filled it up. Pretty soon, all the rivers and canals were drying up and there was barely any water for the Aatham to continue their traditional farming. You can just imagine how scared, mad, or angry the Aatham felt about losing their important resource. All of the things we discussed so far, the ceremony, the foods, farming, the basket materials, the animals, the land, they were changing and being affected by the loss of water. Just like what happened when wind and rain left, the earth dried up. So the Aatham fought hard for their rights to water. This fight lasted for more than a hundred years. The federal government tried helping them by building water pumps in the 1900s to help water flow to the Aatham fields. But eventually they shut them down in 1917 because it was just too expensive to keep it running. Then the government and the city of Tucson tried digging wells. But oftentimes the wells were dry or there wasn't enough for Aatham farms. This is a historical photo of some Aatham women trying to retrieve water from a well. You can see the traditional pots on their head. I wonder how much water they were able to get. Probably not very much. This photo shows a very dry farm field. And if you think about it, horses, cows, and other farm animals need water too. But because there was not enough water for them, the Aatham sometimes had to sell their farm animals to Americans who had all of the water. The Aatham also had to rely on the government for food. This is not fair. Something had to be done. Another attempt was made by the government to control the water by building a large dam in the Gila River in the 1930s. This was known as the Coolidge Dam. 
It stored water for all farmers, but there still wasn't enough since during those times a large drought happened, and what water was available in the dam went mostly to Anglo-American farmers. The landscape just wasn't looking the same anymore, and the autumn were desperate for water and coming up with ideas to help save the traditional ways. So in 1978, the Aatam took the water issue to court and threatened to sue the federal government over the historic loss of water. The government agreed to a settlement of $15 million and a promise to the water that came from the Central Arizona Project. The Central Arizona Project gets its water from the Colorado River, and that's where we get some of our water today. In the 1980s, the Tahana Atham also fought for their water rights in court and were promised access to the water from the Central Arizona Project, too. They did not see the water until the 1990s. Once the Akimara and Tohono people received the water, they were able to rebuild their farms. You can see them spread all across southern Arizona, and you've probably passed by them along the freeways. The San Javier Co-op Farm is in Tucson and you can buy some of their foods in their store located on the San Javier Reservation. There are many programs that teach young Otham students today how to grow traditional foods. They also grow plants for basket makers and for other traditional tools they may need. Overall, the Otham are still here today and they are happy that they can continue their traditions so they are not lost or forgotten. Phew, now that was a lot of information on the Atom. But I hope you learned a lot today and had some fun looking at some culture materials. This is just one culture group in the Passive Life exhibit. Perhaps on another day, we can take a look at another one. What are some things that you've learned today? Try answering some of these questions. You can pause this video to look at each one of them and try to answer them. If you can't remember, simply just go back in the video and try to find the answers. I had so much fun having you as my museum adventurer, but now I must go back to work in the museum and do some more research. Thank you for coming today, and we hope to see you back here soon. Goodbye!